when Boo Boo who said I do says I don't. Do you trust God? When you have no clue as to where the next dime or dollar is going to come from, do you trust God? When you find out that friends are fake and enemies are real, yeah. Yeah. Hey, do, do you trust God? As we allow those who are waiting to worship, I invite you to journey with me in your Bibles to what I might suggest to you today is one of the most powerful declarations of faith that you'll find in all of Scripture. It comes to us from the mouth of Job. And if you would turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Job, if you go to the middle of a good Bible, that's Psalms, and then go left one book and you'll be a Job. And in the 13th chapter, there is a word that Job lifts up that will prayerfully encourage someone in the midst of a struggle this morning. When you found the 13th chapter of Job, would you physically stand if you're able? And hear the power of what Job declares in verse 15. In Job chapter 13 and verse 15, Job simply says this. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's enough. Do me a favor if you would play preacher and just ask your neighbor the title of today's sermon. Say, neighbor. Oh neighbor, oh neighbor, do you, do you trust, God? trust God? You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Do you trust God? I was at a pastor's conference earlier this year out in San Diego. In one of the breakout sessions, they attempted to partner young preachers with seasoned pastors to give them some time for some mentoring and questions. I felt some kind of way when I found out I was the seasoned pastor. <laughs> and that I had been assigned a cohort of young seminarians to sit with and mentor. As we're talking about ministry, one of the young men asked me, what is it like to pastor Alfred Street Baptist Church? said to him, it's arguably one of the greatest joys of my life, that there's nothing in the world that really compares with knowing that God is using you to help transform people's lives. There's nothing like being part of God's process of redeeming someone from the hand of the enemy. There's nothing like allowing God to use you to stand and as feeble as you are, preach with power and authority. And there's nothing in the world like being loved on by a group of people who see you in a better light than you see yourself. I share with them it is arguably one of the greatest experiences of my life. And Pat, before I could finish, uh, another young man raised his hand and he said, I can't wait to be a pastor. I said, hold on. I said, I need to let you know, this is not for the faint at heart. That this is not always hallelujah and thank you, Jesus. And what most young preachers don't realize, there is a process to prominence. You don't just wake up at Alfred Street. You, you got to pay your dues and climb up the ladder. And I told him that, that if you are not called to this, you ought to seek gainful employment somewhere else. Because this is a relentless job that will wear on your soul. And the rate of burnout in pastors is higher than any other career or calling you will find. One of the things that makes pastoring difficult, if I can just bleed on y'all for a little bit, is that pastoring requires a multitude of skills they don't teach you in seminary. No, if you're going to pastor, you, you got to know how to team build. You have to know how to develop leaders. And you better know how to resolve conflict. 
because the number one job of a pastor is referee in fights. <laughs> if, if you're going to pastor, you have to have some administrative ability. You've know, you, you got to understand legal language. You got to have some financial acumen. You got to know how to read a balance sheet. You got to know how to deal with some HR issues. If you're going to pastor, you, you got to be able to teach the word of God and feed people with knowledge and understanding. If you're going to pastor, Kevin, you got to be a chaplain. You got to know how to sit at a bedside and outside of a jail cell and give somebody hope and encouragement. If you're going to pastor, you got to know how to preach with power and authority. You got to feed people not only in their heart, but also their head. If you're going to pastor, you got to be a theologian. You've got to wrestle with the fact that, that our God's ways are higher than our ways, and we don't always understand what God is doing. If you're, if you're going to pastor, you, you got to be a prophet. You, you got to be able to speak truth to power in ways that are not always politically correct and will get you emails sent. And one of the things seminary doesn't really prepare you to do as a pastor is to know how to be involved in pastoral counseling. Counseling is probably the hardest part of what I do. Even though I love people and I'm trying to be an empathetic listener, pastoral counseling is hard for two reasons. Number one, the size and scope of most people's problems is greater than my ability to help you with. I've had people stand and tell me everything that was going on in their life. They said, Pastor, what do you think? <laughs> I think you need some help. That's what I think. I... <laughs> you need to go find someone with a degree on the wall because I can't help you. That, that's outside. I had one semester of pastoral counseling. I can't help you, but we can pray. <laughs> and the other reason I have difficulty with pastoral counseling is not only because most issues are greater than my own understanding, but I was raised by a dad who was real old school. My, my dad believed that if you're going through the going through, you got one or two choices. Either get over it, or don't. And don't waste my time if you ain't trying to get over it. And because of that, I, I, I kind of believe that no matter what your issue is in life, and I don't mean to oversimplify the complexities and the causalities of whatever your issues are, but I've come to the realization that for me, no matter what you're going through in life, life always boils down to one question. Do you trust God? I, I mean, I, I don't mean to trivialize your trauma. And I'm not trying to simplify the storm you're in. I, I'm not trying to, to, to make easy the struggle you're facing in life. But I want to tell you that no matter what it is, it starts and stops with the same question. Do you trust God? I know it hurts. I know it's been chronic. I know it's disappointed you. I know you didn't think life would turn out like this. But at the end of the day, you have to be able to answer one question. Do you trust God? When the doctor comes back in the room, says, I found something. Do you trust God? When a job you thought was secure lays you off. Do you trust God? When boo-boo who said I do says I don't, do you trust God? When you have no clue as to where the next dime or dollar is going to come from, do you trust God? When you find out that friends are fake and enemies are real, yeah. Yeah. Hey, do, do you trust God? That, my brothers and sisters, is the core question that all of us must answer along this life journey. And it is the question that drives the saga and the story that is Job. Job is arguably the most well-known person in Scripture. Because even if you've never read 
Job's book, you're going to walk in Job's shoes. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of a song I like that, that Aaron Neville made popular in 1991, but it was originally released by a group called The Main Ingredient in 1972. 1972 is arguably God's best creative year. God did great things in 1972. In 1972, Main Ingredient lifted up a song that went a little something like this. Everybody plays the fool sometime. There's no exception to the rule. It may be factual. See, I knew y'all didn't go to church your whole life. And it may be cruel, but, but everybody plays the fool. Listen, listen. Everybody in here will play Job at some moment in your life. At some moment, you're going to go through a struggle that makes no sense. At some moment, you're going to lose something or someone that you think God should let live. At some moment, a sickness will hit you that you worked hard not to have. And all of us will be in a place where we bow before God and ask God, why? You know the story of Job. He is the holiest man in the city in which he lives. And the Bible says, to what amounts more to nothing than a wager between Satan and God, God allows Job to lose everything. Disaster takes his fortune. Disease torments his flesh. And death troubles his family. And this man who's had disaster hit him, disease find him, and death touch him, you would think that after everything he goes through, that he's ready to give up on God. As a matter of fact, that's at the core of what the devil presented to God. The devil says to God, listen, if you let me have my way with Job for just a few hours, Job will curse you to your face. Job will give up on God. Job will throw up his hands. Job will quit. Job will want to have nothing to do with you if you just allow me to have my way. The Bible says that after the devil has done everything that he can, after he's allowed disaster to take his fortune, after disease has tormented his flesh, after death has troubled his family, the devil finds out that he can't touch Job's faith. Because after everything Job has gone through, Job declares in verse 15, if the Lord slays me, yet will I trust God. I, I want you to hear the depth of this declaration that, that no matter what goes down in my life, I've made a decision to trust God. When I don't understand it, I trust him. When it doesn't make sense to me, I trust him. When it's not the answer to the prayer I prayed, I trust him. When the unexpected finds me, I trust him. When I'm left all by myself, I trust him. I've made a decision, come hell or high water, no matter what I go through, I will trust in God. But beloved, beloved, this Job has found out that no matter what Satan does, I'm going to trust God. And Satan has tried through three different scenarios to test Job's trust. And if I know Satan like Job knows Satan, those same three are operating in your life. There are three times you really have to activate your trust in God. Can I tell you when you've got to make a decision to trust God? Number one, you've got to decide to trust God when people have hurt you. When people have hurt you to the core of your heart, that's when you've got to make a deliberate decision to trust God. Beloved, the Bible says that Job has some friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And these three friends, when they realize that Job is struggling, 
they show up and they sit with Job. Because there's something to be said about the ministry of presence. That sometimes I just need you there. Bible says it all is well until they start talking. And when they start talking, they start accusing Job of being a sinner. This is what they say in case you've never read it. They say, listen, Job, there's no way in the world you're going through what you're going through and you ain't done nothing. Somehow, some way, you've sinned, you have not confessed, and you have not repented. So in order for this to end, you need to go on and tell us what you done did. And Job is hurt because he's taken his whole life to prove that he's holy, he's upright, and he loves God. And beloved, let me tell you what will hurt you most in life. Nothing hurts more than when you think you've proven yourself to someone who then doubts you at the drop of a dime. Can I tell you what hurts? When you've tried to prove your character and somebody doubts you, not with evidence, but based on a rumor. When you have shown yourself faithful to someone who doubts you based off a suspect source that they heard in the beauty salon. Nothing hurts more than to try to prove yourself to someone who then doesn't believe in you when they've heard something, not with evidence, but what's being whispered about. Beloved, I believe this is what John Bevere was talking about in his book called The Bait of Satan. And John Bevere argues that Satan always has someone on assignment to bring offense and hurt to you because the devil knows when you're offended and when you're hurt, you will break your trust in God and try to handle matters on your own. Can I preach right here? Uh, uh, I, I want you to know that every day you wake up, Satan has assigned somebody to get on your nerves. Every day, somebody is on satanic speed dial to be disrespectful to you, to offend you, to hurt you. Every day, somebody wakes up with one agenda, and that is to try to take you out. And the devil knows that if they can get under your skin. You will break your trust in God when you decide you got to handle them on your own. Because don't nothing make you let go of God more than feeling you got to get somebody told. As a matter of fact, there's somebody, you glad you came to church this morning because you had it set in your mind that tomorrow morning, if she looked at you the wrong way, it was going down right there. You didn't have about enough. You're going to get somebody told. You're going to cuss somebody out. And watch this. And you even made peace with God with it. <laughs> Come on, be, be honest. You reached that place where you said, listen, God, I know I ain't supposed to, but you're going to have to forgive me on this one because she brought it on herself. She deserves it. I got to do what got to be done. They did it to me. I got to do it to them. We love getting even with folk. And one of the ways the devil pulls you outside of the will of God is to allow someone to hurt you and you feel you've got to get even with them. So, when you've been hurt, when someone has offended you, when they've left a bad taste in your mouth, I need you to trust this one thing, that God is omniscient. That God knows what they did. God heard what they said. God knows how it hurt you. And he's so much God that he can handle for you better than you can handle for you. Can I tell you something real quick? Ain't nothing 
like turning an enemy over to God. I know you want to put your hand on them. I know you want to put your mouth on them. But the best thing you can do is put your enemies in the hand of God and trust that God is able to handle what happened. Can I preach right here? The Bible says in Psalm 37, fret not thyself over evildoers, neither be thou envious of the workers of iniquity. Wish I had a Bible reader. Because they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither away like the green herb. And I wish I had a witness in here that God knows how to handle your haters. God knows how to move your enemies. God knows how to prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. God knows how to make certain no weapon formed against you. God knows how to take what they meant for evil and work it together for your good. God knows how to say, if you stand still, I'll fight your battles for you. Is there anybody here that's ever trusted God with the people in your life and God did make a way? You, 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 you just have to trust God. I'm trying to make this real simple. You ain't got to cuss nobody out. You don't have to lay hands on nobody. You don't have to bust nobody's windows. For those that have been redeemed from the urban side of life, The Lord, the Lord knows how to handle that stuff. You've got to trust God when people have hurt you. Number two, you've got to trust God when your past haunts and hinders you. Here, here's what your neighbor won't tell you, but I'm going to tell you for him. Uh, everybody in here has a past. And if, if I know you, like I know me, everything in my past is not glorious. I mean, really, 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 there's some stuff I've done that if the Lord went public with it, we'd only have one service. And don't look at me like that, because if God went public with yours, you wouldn't even come to church. Everybody has passed. And here's what happens. Whenever God is trying to usher you through a new door of opportunity, the devil has a way of assigning an usher with the gift of memory to stand at that door. Someone who always wants to remind you about what you used to do, where you used to go, what you used to be. There's, there's some folk that hold on to what you used to be, and they won't release you to what God is calling you to be. And the problem Job makes is that Job argues for 30 chapters with folk about his past. He wastes chapters of his life trying to prove to folk that he ain't who they thought he was. Can I give you this one for free? Stop arguing with folk who want to hold you hostage to something the Lord has already brought you out of. Just because they remember it doesn't mean you have to relive it. You, you know what that's like? That, that's like going to grandma's house and she's got a picture of you on the wall from 82 with a jerry curl. And you gonna let somebody make you feel bad in 2016 because you had a jerry curl in 82. Listen, listen, that's the way I used to look. But that's not how I look right now. 
And what I can't do is allow you to hold me hostage to what I used to be when I know that God has changed and transformed my life into something better than I used to be. Is there anybody here who knows that you're not perfect, but God has changed you? Hey! I don't do what I used to do. I don't go where I used to go. I don't act like I used to act. I'm not who I was. And so Job is arguing with these folk about who he used to be. And all of a sudden he stops talking to them and starts talking to God. Because Job comes to the realization that you need to come to. And that is, I don't have to work my sin out with you. Go on, say that, preacher. Uh, uh, Because if the truth be told, you can't forgive me of my sin. Let me preach this, let me preach this. When I sin, my sin may offend you, but my sin is against God. And you can't forgive me of my sin. You can forgive me of my offense but you can't forgive me of my sin because you don't have the authority to release me from the sin I committed. My sin is against God. Go on, let me give you a side order of scripture. When, when, when David commits adultery with Bathsheba and he sits down to write his repentance in Psalm 51, he says to the Lord, against you and you only have I sinned because my sin is against God. And if God forgives my sin, okay, 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 I'm I'm about about to test your amen right here. Get, Get your amen button out, here it is. Here's the good news. Other people may not release you of the offense, but God will always forgive you of the sin. Jeff, turn this mic back on. Others may not forgive you of the offense, but God will always forgive you of the sin. If we confess our sin, God is faithful and just and will forgive us of all our unrighteousness. He is a forgiving God. Yeah, so I need you to trust that God is a merciful God. As a matter of fact, the next time someone tries to hold you hostage to what you used to be, I need you to hit them with Psalm 136. You ain't got to turn, I'll tell you what it says. Psalm 136 has 26 verses. And I'm going to show you how to memorize all 26. Verse 1. His mercy endures forever. Verse 2, his mercy endures forever. Verse 3, his mercy endures forever. Verse 4, his mercy endures I'm going to keep going. Verse 5, his mercy endures forever. Verse 6, his mercy endures forever. Verse 7, his mercy endures forever. Verse 8, his mercy endures Verse 9, his mercy. Verse 10, his mercy. Verse 11, his mercy. So the next time you try to make me feel guilty about what I did, his mercy endures forever. Yes, I fell. His mercy endures forever. Yes, I messed up. His mercy endures forever. Yes, I dropped the ball. His mercy endures forever. No, I'm not perfect, but his mercy endures forever. And I trust that the mercy of God is greater than my sin. I trust that God knows what they did. I trust that God's mercy is greater than my mess up. And watch this last one when you really got to learn to trust God. When your problems are heavier than you can handle. When it gets to be too much. 
Well, watch what happens when you read the story of Job. You see a man who goes, Charles, through a progression of losses. Money, gone. Children, killed. Servants, slaughtered. Health, taken. Reputation, destroyed. Even his marriage is put in jeopardy because his wife tells him, you ought to curse God and die. Job finds out what many of us have learned in life. If it ain't one thing, go and help me preach my sermon. <laughs> it's another. If it's not your money, it's your marriage. If it's not your marriage, it's your job. If it's not your job, it's your health. If it's not your health, you got one child acting crazy. And the minute you get them right, the second one want to act a fool. If it's not one thing, it's another. You know what, you know what that, that teaches us about Job? And I, I got to hang out here for a minute. It reminds me that although our church cliches mean well, most of them are biblically and theologically inaccurate. Let me give you an example. That cliche, when the praises go up, the blessings come down. That's theologically inaccurate. That's as if to suggest that God has some blessings on will call for you, <laughs> that he's determined he's not going to give you unless you shout amen. Uh, God is not so fickle that God needs you to holler before God, does, if God's gonna bless you, God's gonna bless you. Yeah. That, that, that cliche, that cliche is off. That, that cliche, uh, the race is not given to the swift, nor the bow to the strong, uh, but to, what, well, how's it finished? But to the ones who endure the end, that, that ain't nowhere in the Bible. That, that, that's, that's not scripture, that, 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 that's theologically and biblically inaccurate, because in Ecclesiastes, what it says, the race is not given to the swift, nor about to the strong, but time and chance happens to everybody. There's nowhere in the Bible it says, but they that endure to the end. That ain't nowhere in Scripture. <laughs> and you know what the life of Job proves? That there's another cliche that's wrong. The cliche that says, he'll never put more on you. Somebody knows that's a lie. Because <laughs> it seemed like life can add more and more and more and more on you till you reach a point where you can't bear it any longer. And it's in that moment that you become like Job and say, God, you know what? All I can do is trust you. I don't understand this, but I trust you. This is more than I asked for, but I trust you. I don't know what the, you're up to, but I trust you. This is not the way my life ought to look, but God, I trust you. Have you ever had a place where all you could do is give it to God and say, God, all I can do is trust you? In, in that moment. I need you to trust that God can handle it. Watch what God does, and I'm done with this little sermon. When God recognizes that Job has gotten to a place where all he can do is say, God, I trust you, God shows up, and watch what God does. You read the end of the book of Job. God takes Job on a cosmic field trip. God grabs Job, takes him outside, and shows him some things. He says, look, look at the stars up in the sky. Go look at the sun rising in the east and setting in the west. Feel the wind blowing against your skin. See the fish swimming downstream. Look at the leaves change color in the fall. And after showing Job everything, God then asked Job some questions. He said, Job, where were you when I put all this together? Job, how did the stars get where they are? Why does the sun rise in the east every day? When will the leaves change color? Why do the fish swim upstream? 
Why is there grizzly in the bear and Bow Wow in the dog? Job, why is all this happening? And Job cannot answer God. And the message God is trying to get to Job is the message I'm trying to get to you. That when life becomes too much and you feel that you just can't take anymore, God wants to remind you that the same way I rise the sun every morning and the same way I flung the stars in the sky and the same way I make the grass grow in the field. I'm the same God who's got my hand on your life. And God's message to Job is the message God gives to you. I got this. Don't you worry. I got this. Don't be afraid. I got this. Don't lose sleep. I got this. Is there anybody here who knows we serve a God who's able to take care of every issue in your life? God's. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Here it is. Y'all sit down. Watch this. Here it is. So the Lord says, Job, I want you to trust me. And in order for you to trust me, I'm going to show you some things that make you trust me. I'm going to show you what I'm able to do. And when you see what I'm able to do, I want you to trust me. So watch this. God's about to help somebody right now trust him. I want to see, standing on your feet, people in the sanctuary who know what it's like to be broke. No, 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 no. I ain't talking about you were waiting on the check. I'm talking about when you knew that check wasn't going to cover what you had owed. And didn't the Lord make a way in your life? Didn't the Lord send some surprise money? Didn't the Lord have somebody slip a $20 bill in your hand? If you know that God is able, then you ought to trust God right now. Somebody holler, I trust God. Okay, y'all sit down, y'all sit down. Okay, that didn't get you up. I want to talk to folk that been uh, sick as a dog. I ain't talking about no Tylenol sick. I'm talking about chemotherapy sick. I'm talking about dialysis sick. I'm talking about invasive heart surgery sick. And you are on a bed of affliction and you didn't know whether you want to live or whether you wanted to die. But God healed your body and brought you back to the house of God. If that's you, I need you to stand real quick. And I need somebody to say, I trust God because I see what God is able to do in my life. Is there anybody here that made a decision right now? I'm going to trust God. I don't understand it, but I trust him. I will trust him. And Job says, if he slays me, I will trust him. If the Lord calls me home to glory, I still trust him. If today is my last day, I still trust God. I trust God to take me to my home in glory. I trust God to watch over my family when I'm gone. I trust God to continue the great work that he's done through me. I trust God. And beloved, those three words will pull you through some mighty bad storms in life. They'll allow you to look at diagnosis and forecasts and trouble and know that God is still worthy to be trusted. I trust God and that, that, that's what led those hymn writers to put pen to paper say I will trust in the Lord 
until I die. I will trust in the Lord until I die. God, I'm learning to trust you. And Lord, I acknowledge that that shouldn't be so difficult because you have shown time and time and time again that you work things together for my good. But Lord, right now with this thing I'm going through, I make a decision and declaration on this Sunday morning to say I trust you. I trust you with my health. I trust you with my money. I trust you with my marriage. I trust you with my children. I trust you with my job. God, as a matter of fact, I just trust you with everything. Lord, allow that to give me strength to face tomorrow. Strength to go back home tonight. Strength to live through this next season, no matter what the procedures may be. And declare every morning I wake up, I trust God. In Jesus' name, amen.